Hello, I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen, editor of Streaming Media and conference chair for Streaming Media Connect. Welcome to our fifth Streaming Media Connect virtual conference. I know we're all eager to get back to in-person conferences, but in the meantime, these Connect events have given us a chance to keep the conversation going in ways that we might not have otherwise. And in some ways, uh, we've been able to bring together people who we wouldn't have been able to bring together in person at all. So it's really been a joy to do these for you. But we are planning and working on streaming Media West, and we are all systems go for that in Huntington Beach the first week of November. Uh, you can go look in the chat and Steve Nathans Kelly, our, our producer, will pop in the link for Streaming Media West there. We'll have the speakers up um, on the website soon, but the entire program is up there so you can take a look and, uh, and even start to register. So before we begin with the next session, though, I'd like to thank our diamond sponsor for Streaming Media Connect, and that's Limelight Networks. Limelight Networks is helping bring you this entire week's uh, group of presentations. We've got 15 sessions total. And thanks again to Limelight Networks for helping us bring those sessions to you. And of course, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this session, Visionular. Visionular Zoe Liu is going to be talking about using their AI plus codec to improve compression and viewer experience. If you have questions for Zoe during or after her presentation, please type them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and I will forward them or share them with Zoe uh, at the end of her presentation. Also, if you stick around, and you should, you'll be entered for a chance to win a $50 Amazon gift card, but you must be present to win. So at the end of the presentation, we will announce the winner of that $50 Amazon gift card. So with those housekeeping notes out of the way, I'd like to introduce Zoe Liu, the co-founder, president, and CTO of Visionular. Hi, Zoe, how are you? Oh, your mic's still off. Uh, I'm just too excited. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me here. You bet. Go ahead uh, and I'll pass it over to you. Take it away. And um, we'll come back together for questions after your presentation. Okay. So now I'm going to just uh, start to share the screen. So um, it's great to be here. And this is Zoe from Renuller. I'm going to mainly talk about uh, one thing is the uh, AI plus codec technologies and mainly focus on how we leverage these technologies behind the scene to really uh, improve or provide the best possible video experiences to our streaming users. So I'm going to talk about the mainly through five sessions. And the first one is what is AI codec that uh, I'm going to focus on today. And so this is an overall end-to-end -end solution, basically covering different uh, scenarios uh, for video streaming. There could be VOD and live streaming with either uh, a tolerance some delay or sometimes it's extremely low delay user cases. So from here, we are mainly focused on three things. The first one is we want to talk about what are the core video codec technologies that really we need and potentially can greatly power the best possible user experiences for streaming. And secondly, we want to talk about the video compression or video codec that is being facilitated by the AI-based processing. So we're basically talking about how we jointly optimize the processing and compression to really boost up further the video experiences. And certainly we want to emphasize the role of video quality assessment. We're going to talk about the blind video quality assessment that doesn't have the raw what the source video, what the reference available. And there's of course, there's going to be one the reference uh, that are available. So fundamentally, we want to talk about the quality assessment guided joint optimization of the compression and processing technologies. And next, uh, let's go to the core, the core technologies. We want to give an example down here. So there's a lot of new compression technologies coming out during the past few years. Here we just give you an example for AV1, because AV1 is a new standard. And we also have a lot of other standards available. For example, H264 AVC, 
I would say it's still the dominant video codec standard because it's uh, basically power the majority, uh, more than 60% of the videos globally, and also ABC provides a unanimous hardware decoding uh, platforms right now. But AV1 as a new uh, codec standard has been uh, a little more than three years old. It was finalized in July 2018. By now, compared to its predecessor VP9, it's actually provided more than 100 coding tools. We use this example to see what video codec can bring to us. So this is one example. For AV1, it for the first time to include the coding tools dedicated to encoding the screen content in this main profile. So right now we have so many contents that are in the internet. So what we can do with the AV1 coding tools dedicated for screen content, we gave example down here. And here we use x 4 the well-known uh, open source H, uh, ABC or H64 uh, encoder. This is a 1080p uh, screen content, typical screen content sequence that has been used widely. We encode it at 800 kilobits per second. We end up with this quality. And we use uh, our own uh, AV1 encoder, but just an example. So with AV1, a standard aligned encoder, we end up with this quality. So the difference is quite obvious here. But here for AV1, we'll only use half of the bit rate as we use for X64. So with even less of the bit rate, we add up with a much better visual quality down here. These are mostly benefited by the coding tools brought out by the new standard AV1. And of course, you got to sacrifice something because the use of the new coding tools, the encoder could be more complicated. It can use more CPUs it can protect the cause for the delay. So here we just give example, x 4 the setup we use is, is uh, still very fast and it definitely can, for example, on the Intel Core i7, use only one core, uh, x 4 can encode more than 130 frames per second. It's pretty fast. And uh, however, we can see that uh, this is AV1 encoder developed out by us. Still, it is slower. It's about uh, one third of the speed of what X64 can achieve, but it still can achieve more than 45 per frame per second, one core CPU. So meaning that for 1080p videos for 30 frame per second source is definitely good enough to be leveraged. While it can achieve a big bit rate uh, BD rate saving, meaning that to achieve the same quality, you may only use a quarter or even less bit rate, which can potentially boost up the great user experiences. So uh, we also compare down here, uh, like generations over generation, for example, over the HEVC is a newer standard compared to H uh, compared to H64 because H64 was finalized 2003 and HEV is finalized 2013 and AV1 we just mentioned finalized in 2018. So we can see that compared against X64, X265 median in this slide and AV1 can achieve uh, a little bit uh, this lower compared to X65 medium, but very close, but it definitely can achieve a lot better coding performance here, we use a different quality uh, score uh, metrics like PSN, ICMB map. In general, over this standard uh, test set here, we mentioned have different resolutions of 1080p to 360p, and AV1 can achieve more than 35% bit rate saving to achieve the same quality. So here we would just want to emphasize that with new generations of video codec technologies, we really can achieve better quality while using a less bit, meaning that with uh, uh, limited bandwidth, we actually can really boost up the user experiences to have a better quality while using a lot less bandwidth. So that's talking about the core co uh, codec, we're moving about the processing. 
So processing meaning that right now we really experience uh, explosive uh, video usage. It has been widely uh, acknowledged that over the internet data, video uh, uh, basically contributes more than 80% of the data right now. So there's uh, so many different content, like we have screen content talking about this uh, premium content, there is about outdoor, indoor gaming, and, and all kinds of different content. So it's very naturally to think about if we can differentiate between different content and apply according video codec technologies to handle them, we definitely can achieve better quality while using less bitrate. And also even within a video, there's some regions that's really amenable or significant to our human eyes because human eyes are the eventual observ observers of the streaming of videos. So let's give a one example, the region of interest to see what we can do to further boost up the video quality using the uh, motion learning based uh, processing schemes. So here we have an example, let's just, uh, it's a screen uh, capture of two videos compared against each other using the sliding window mode. So it can be seen that is actually the left side is the original video that uploaded to the cloud. When the video up to the cloud, there already could be here some compression artifacts. And it usually goes through with the transcoding before it is further redistributed. Here we, we basically want to see that is with some region of interest, of course, here face is very important. We can not only further to squeeze out the bits to make the video smaller by doing transcoding, but actually applying some pre-processing can proactively removing some of the artifacts presented in the source video upload to the cloud can even boost the quality by doing transcoding. So we give another example. This example is from different angle. This example is when we try to do the transcoding of a video, we can really focus on the region of interest with again other faces. So the left is a source that is the input to the transcoder and the right side is indeed the output uh, uh, here with the two different screens. So let, let me restate it. So the left video is a general output of a transcoder and the right side is actually using exact the same or less bitrate, but applies with the technology of region of interest. So it can be seen that is with the same bitrate, but when we really think about the region of interest with our faces down here, we can actually preserve a lot of the details within the video, uh, the most interesting regions, while not incurring more bitrate. So the same bitrate, but really focus on the region of interest can preserve a lot of the details for the regions that uh, human eyes really care about. So with all of this, uh, and uh, excuse me, we can really just uh, preserve the better quality while boosting up further the video encoder performance. So we basically from the encoder to further boost up the encoder plus. So here example that uh, um, we can further achieve compared to access before to achieve originally, we achieve about on the left side about 25 to 30 percent of bitrate saving, and then with facilitated by boosting up the pre-processing using VMAX as uh, the quality score, we can achieve actually 15 percent more uh, of the bitrate saving to achieve the same VMAX. And of course, there's uh, some uh, complexity that can be incurred, but not too much. So actually, compared to S4. Is about 13% more composition incurred. And with a plus, some processing involved, it's going to be 20% compared to access four. So the plus version of the encoder compared to the non plus is with the 7% more complexity and up with a lot better quality. And the same thing with this example, we basically involving the processing, we can achieve a further bit rate savings 
while achieving a better VMAP score or more uh, uh, pleasant video qualities. And the lastly, we want to talk about what the video quality assessment can bring to us. So when videos uploaded to the cloud, we are not able to access the original video anymore. In this sense, we need a video quality assessment approach right now, widely uh, referred to as blind video quality assessment. So in this way, um, we have a better knowledge how these videos, how they are present eventually to the human eyes. But what we can do is if we have a blind video quality assessment technologies, we can differentiate between different videos and the categorize them into different categories and say to good and medium and poor video qualities. And what we can do further, for example, if the quality is very poor, we can, uh, a lot of things that can be applied. If that is actually categorized into the medium category, there's some enhancement we can further apply. And uh, the, the, the thing is we mentioned, because when we apply some enhancement into the videos, there's definitely some further computational complexity will get involved. But if the video is too poor, it's actually sometimes not quite worth to apply that kind of enhancement because the quality is very poor. Even there's a lot of enhancement that could be boosted and still not quite worth it in the overall joint performance. And here we gave an example what we can do re really with the blind video quality assessment. There's a lot of researches and a lot of practice already happening in the academic and in the industry. So this is some scheme that we developed applied to a short video app platform. And originally, uh, our customers provide us 800 videos with the ground truth. Ground truth is the human subject mean opinion scores to give the score of each video between zero and five. And then after we apply our predictor using the deep learning approach, we predict for each video uh, uh, their own quality scores. And we try to evaluate whether the predicted scores can really close to ground truth. Of course, we use a smaller training side while applying our approach to a test set. So finally, uh, uh, we hand over our predictor to the customer. They actually apply it to a testing set of 8,000, 10 times of the volume of the training set. It's end up, yes, we can really do a good job in general, so between the score between zero and five, so finally the predicted score compared to the ground truth is somewhere between the mean is somewhere between uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. Uh, it's uh, the mean is within 0 0.3 and the variance is within 0 0.5. So we can really predict a good score down there. And finally, we can apply additional categorization to these videos so that we can process them really differently, like I just mentioned. And beyond that, we really want to say that there's a lot of things that we can do for the video quality evaluation. On the bottom of this slide, we want to mention a paper that has been a joint effort between uh, the UT Austin and, and the Amazon Prime video. So because quality, video quality has many stages, like the very beginning we mentioned, when it goes through the network, there could be some, uh, especially for live streaming, there could be some packet loss from some data buffers. So it's very important that we collect a lot of ground truth to really represent a different artifacts that are manifested during streaming and use that as the ground truth to further train our algorithms. That's one aspect that I want to emphasize on here. Another thing is besides all these quality scores using objective method, there's still going to be a lot of important things that we need to get involved as objective quality uh, assessment. So um, a great, a uh, tool that facilitated the subtitle quality assessment will be very important, especially if we have a tool on the web-based. And in the end, we want to say what's going to be the next for the AI plus codec. There's a lot of resources going on. For example, there's a paper uh, that mentioned that 
for an existing codec aligned video, we can do some post processing by leveraging uh, the frames of prediction inside the encoder and further boost down here. There's a lot of potential can further boost the bit rate savings. So here in the figures is basically saying that you will apply some out loop, which means that we don't have to get a new technology still stand aligned. And there is a lot of further bit rate that we can achieve. And uh, for the next standard, because we mentioned that the code is evolving from one to the next generation, if we involve some in loop, meaning that we have some enhancement technologies, but within the encoder core, for example, every video frame is used a reference frame that we can create some quite more complicated reference frame to achieve even further bit rate savings. So the next means that we are eyeing future is going to be the video technology new standard is coming out along the way. So in the end, this is my last slide. We're talking about the quality assessment guided joint processing and uh, video compression optimization. And there's a lot of things that we can potentially do down here to further boost up the user experience for streaming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one says, you mentioned the 47.x uh, frame per second encoding on single CPU. Is that measuring after the pre-processing steps have been performed already? And if so, how much pre-processing time is required before the encoding stage on the same hardware? Oh, so basically uh, I present that slide in the core codec session. That means that it's only represent for the core encoder of AV1 because AV1 introduced the coding tools of for screen content. So there's no pre-processing for that scheme. And so the, the, the speed is basically measured between X to the frame encoder and our AV1 encoder without any pre-processing applied. So the speed doesn't, uh, it, it, there's no pre-processing and also the bit rate savings also doesn't include any pre-processing down there. Okay. Um, you talked to, I know you uh, shared the findings of a couple of independent papers. Uh, how has the Aurora One codec performed in, you know, well-known um, video quality assessments like, say, the Moscow State University tests or, or other, you know, fairly well-known uh, video quality assessments? Oh, yeah. So we have, uh, for our Aurora One, I, I, I basically just want to say, it's just an example of the AV1 encoder. And then also AV1 is just an example of a many codec standard. This is what I really want to present in this slide. But to answer your question, yes, our Aurora has attended the past 2019 and 2020, uh, like Moscow State University evaluation, and it's already published on the website. So we basically, uh, like for the most recent, for example, they are uh, mainly evaluating for the full HD 1080p, and there's an evaluation, and then we uh, achieve the first place compared to other encoders of AV1 compared to other codec standard. And of course, I think the optimization is ongoing. We also really appreciate the effort from the open source community. Mm -hmm. For example, for AV1, I, I did I, I didn't mention, but it's in my slide that I mentioned there's a. Uh, quite some open source AV1 encoder, for example, the code base like Ravi, LibOM, SVT AV1. And we always saying that we're actually standing on top of the giant folders and then climb up. So we sure. really appreciate that. Okay. What are some of the, uh, could you talk a little bit about the use cases that you're finding uh, um, are, are, are most effective using your codex? Um, you know, the people watching maybe uh, from media and entertainment companies, they may be in educational institutions, uh, production companies. What sort of use cases are, are you finding an uptake in? Yeah, I should have made it more clear because originally, I think in one of my slides, is, we do mention there's a VAR, there's a live streaming, mm -hmm. and there's a stream like RTC. So basically, it's very low delay, like what we're doing through Zoom. And actually, we really want to cover all the scenarios. That's the first okay. thing is with a different delay. And sometimes the encoder uh, are deployed over the servers or cloud with more abundant computing resources. Sometimes the encoder has to be deployed on end devices, either PC or mobiles with a limited encoder 
or computation resources. So we really want to cover all of them. For example, everybody like familiar with X64, it in, uh, actually provides a bunch of presets, like from very slow all the way to ultra fast. That's basically try to address different scenario because there is a delay required, there's a competition request, and we really want to cover all of them. So uh, one more example, like I just mentioned the region of interest, the face detection is also well known and a lot of already now for computer vision. So here we also have our own face detector, but mainly used for combined with core codec. When applied for low delay, you really need a fast face detection uh, mm -hmm. scheme. So we have also de uh, developed for different speed levels. Um, so I would say, actually, I think you remind me, not only joint processing, compression, quality, and bit rate optimization, we also need to consider the joint delay and the computational complexity sure. for the, the final optimization. Okay, very good. Uh, that's a great place to close here. Uh, if you look in the chat, if you have any questions for Zoe, her email address, or actually the info at Visionular uh, email address is in the chat. Yeah. It's info at visionular.com. Thank you so much, Zoe, uh, for joining us today. That was really informative, and I'll be excited to see where you're headed in the future.